know, it's crazy how many people out there hunt with very, or hunt on very small uh, private lands. So very few acres that a lot of people hunt with. And I think that's a product of shrinking all overall acreages. Most of the time people aren't buying, landing assemb buying land and assembling it. That does hap happen sometimes. But for the most part, uh, people are hunting on an ever-shrinking size of parcel if they're hunting private land. It's, it's crazy. Public land parcels either stay the same or get bigger for the most part, uh, huge. And so what's funny in relating the two, because I always try to relate public land and private land. It's pretty cool down in the comments below. I get a lot of comments that I only hunt public land, but these concepts apply. And that goes back to my original book, the Red Book in 2012, um, how to design your whitetail parcel, whitetail success by design. And I talk about that intro is, you know, I describe all these concepts. And then in the conclusion, I reveal that the hunt that was relayed in the intro, in the conclusion, I talk about that was a public land buck um, using all these concepts. So it's still really the same. And it's really the same when it comes to micro parcel, because just like you can't afford to make mistakes on a small parcel, you can't afford to make mistakes on public land. Um, you have to be very careful when you hunt. You have to uh, really practice a lot of research and scouting, put everything together, whether you're building it on private land or actually going out and finding it and scouting it on public land. There's a lot of similarities. Those concepts overlap significantly, especially when that parcel size is smaller. smaller. Think about it. If someone has 1,200 acres, 1,000 acres, 2,000 acres, they can afford to make a lot of mistakes and still have a good deer herd on the property to hunt. And might not mean that they shoot those big bucks all the time. In fact, if they're making a lot of mistakes, they're not going to, whether it's on a big part big uh, private parcel or a small private parcel you still can't make mistakes the bottom line is they'll still be there on a big parcel so you can make mistakes uh, you can drive a bus to your tree stand spook all the deer but the size of the parcel at some point encompasses the deer herd and again on micro parcels they do not micro parcel i'm talking about anything up to 40 acres we go to a lot of properties dylan and i joe and kevin that are 20 25 acres 30 acres or less in I've been to a five acre parcel. Uh, Dylan, what's your smallest parcel you've been to? I've only been to a 20. That's the smallest I've been to so far. Okay, yeah, pretty small. And there's times I'll go to say Michigan where there's a lot of fragmented private land and we'll have parcel sizes around 20 to 30 acres on, I'm mean, using my trips this year are nine clients in 10 days. I always take a day off in the middle. I've gone to as many as 13 clients in 15 days. I don't do that anymore getting too old i think um we'll leave that up to dylan <laughs> so but um the parcel sizes a lot of times in michigan are a little bit smaller and uh and i and i like that but the, the interesting thing it takes almost the same time to walk it um typically we walk more in a small parcel than right around the side by side it takes the same amount of time to draw it same takes the same amount of time to talk about it at the end of the day put it all together for the client so you think a small parcel i used to charge a half day but ended up running into a lot of eight nine hour days and, uh, and you find it's the same thing. I quickly realized my mistake about 12, 14 years ago when, when designing properties. So I love working on small parcels because you're taking a lot of things you do as a whole on a giant parcel and shoving into one small parcel. But you really have to make a lot more decisions on food, how much food you have and where. So we're going to talk about that because if you make a mistake on a small parcel, you can't get around it. Um, think about a five, 10 acre parcel. Let's say you had two acres of food. It's located in the wrong spot. Well, you might not be able to ever walk on or off your property without spooking deer, ever. And where if you put a two acre food plot in the wrong spot on 40 acres, 80 acres, 100 acres, there's probably some side of the property or two or three sides that you can get around that property, get around that food plot and not spook deer. So again, the larger the size parcel, the more you can make a few mistakes and the size of the par parcel will help encompass those mistakes and keep you safe, the smaller the parcel, you can't make mistakes. Let's look at this first one. Now, a lot of people ask me what, what's more important, food or cover? Well, that's kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg. It's really tough because once you get onto a moderately sized property, you have to have food, you have to have good browse or the deer aren't going to be there. Now, we look at a lot of properties that are more of a pass-through. I'm thinking of 20 acres in western Illinois I went to a long time ago that was very thick, low brush country, and it was between large portions of woods and flanked by ag on two sides. Pretty cool parcel because the landowner could make this very thick. He could use food plots to direct traffic, mock scrapes, and the deer just simply passing through. They're trying to get from one big parcel to the other. Those are those parcels where it wouldn't matter if it was 20 acres or five. The deer are still passing through it. 
they're passing through the woods. You have two, three, four tree stands to take advantage of different wind, different access, and you sit, especially during the rut, and let, let things happen. Now, a five acre parcel, you're not gonna have enough acreage to have big food plots on and direct traffic the entire season. And there's always exceptions to the rule, but when you have five acres, you're probably not gonna have a two acre food plot. Uh, you just, you can't get in and out of your property without spooking deer. So when I see with five to 10 acre properties, 15 acres, 16, 17 acres, somewhere around there, typically you're using food to direct traffic, meaning that there's big food sources around there somewhere. Deer are passing through. I'm thinking down in Ohio where you can bait, you could have a neighbor that's baiting, you could have another neighbor that's baiting, and you're just sitting in between on a really thick parcel. So you start to focus more on cover, but again, you use food to direct traffic. That could be small little hunting plots, could be a water hole, something that you're saying, okay, when these deer come through this property, I want to put them right in front of my bow stand, and that's pretty easy to do, but you can't take up so much space because the more food you put on a five, 10 acre property, especially when you start getting two acres, acre and a half, two acres in total size, you start to, because of the size of the property, you don't have enough depth on that property, which we'll talk about here in a second. So you start to place deer on the neighbor's property during the daylight. You never want to be the one telling the deer herd, I want you to live in my neighbors for nine out of 10 hours a day of daylight. You want to actually invite them on your property. So if you have a big food source, probably the number one risk factor to deer, that's why I talk about your food plot should be just as much a sanctuary as your bedding area. Now, a lot of people think, well, I'll just go sit on a food plot and blow deer, sit on a food source in general and blow deer, even on public land, who cares? That couldn't be further from the truth. Because if you're trying to be careful, if you have to be careful, if you have a small parcel and you have to be careful, then you're going to spook deer off your property, you quickly turn it nocturnal, and you don't have enough room on your property for there to be any deer that will move through during the daylight, especially when it comes to a mature buck. He's the most hunting pressure wary. Does and fawns can take getting pushed around a little bit. They have a small home range. They're not going to go that far. A buck will move a mile and a half to two miles. He does that regularly, and if you're talking public land, it might be three miles, two miles. He'll move a lot further because he has cover to do so, and he'll take that cover and move. That's when you start getting into the scientific studies where you look at average home range of a mature buck is three square miles, and you'll see him all over there in a study. Well, that's on big public land tracks, big commercial forestry, commercial properties, state land, where deer have that amount of cover. There's not a lot of deer, and deer move a long ways. But when you get fragmented, smaller parcels, the home range of a mature buck during daylight gets very small, and that's why it's critical to not spook them and not make mistakes in these small parcels. So when you get down to five, 10 acres, I'm looking at small eighth of an acre, tenth of an acre, quarter acre food plots with the thought that you're not inviting deer to feed there for two hours at a time anyways. They're living on someone else's property. You're simply directing traffic when they come through. So when that lines up with mock scrapes, water holes if it's dry, a small food plot or two, in that case, I'd recommend clover or something like that that's going to withstand at least a little bit of grazing pressure going into the fall. Something where you establish a thick mat, layered rye, that's why I started using layer rye a lot, long time ago. You look at something like brassica or beans in that case, well, they're browsed very easily, very heavily. So a lot of times that, that sweet spot of October, November, December that you're trying to attract deer to, that food source is long gone before that time. Even with beans, looks like, look at, you, might, you want to have at least five acres, unless it's fenced in. The bottom line is you need to attract deer really on a daily basis, consistently provide them food on larger parcels and on a smaller parcel, five, 10 acres, 15, 16, whatever it might be, you're looking to just direct traffic. So when I get up to that 20, 40 acre mark, I'm really looking at, okay, we have 30 acres of cover in Wisconsin that we hunt. We have about three and a quarter acres of food. We just added a little bit more. I'm just looking at enough food to last for the season. And we have to locate that appropriately, which we'll talk about here in a second. So when you start getting 20 acres, you know, one and a half to two acres of food up through that 50, 60 acre mark is, is pretty appropriate. Even three acres, four acres. And of course, when you start talking 100 acres plus, and that's the problem is I'll, we'll see clients that, yeah, they, they could afford to buy the land. They could afford to have us come out and design a par parcel for them. But on a yearly basis to plant six or eight, eight acres of food that helps support all those acres of 100 acres, 150 acres, they don't have the resources of time, money, or both. And so that's something that has to be considered. You're better off buying a smaller parcel that you can give yourself a complete plan with than buying something larger where you're stretching your resources of both time and money and you can't do it right. And that's what I, that's why I like these small parcels because typically we go to a small parcel property and you can count on the, the owners getting stuff done. They're gonna do the plan. 
And, uh, and, and we enjoy that when, when clients do that. That's a really good thing. So we look at 40 acres, you're looking at, okay, two and a quarter, three acres. Then you design that food to last for the season. If you're trying to, you know, it sounds so good to provide food for the deer year round. I'm going to, I'm going to create, I'm going to really blow up the health of the herd because I'm going to provide food during the summer, during the fall, winter, spring. And you find when you have 40 to 80 acres, hundred acres, 200 acres, 300 acres, you just can't afford to throw food to the side during the summertime when the deer are already experiencing a nine and a half out of 10 with local habitat. So when you get up north in areas that, are, that don't have a lot of ag, there's not a lot of ag, there's not a lot of quality food, but there's not a lot of deer. And so what browse is available that's high quality, that's naturally growing in the woods is enough to support a deer herd without them feeling a loss of any kind of health concerns. The limiting factors in the fall and winter, that's when things start to get serious, whether it's up north or in ag country. You know, right now, we've had, seems like 40, 50 mile an hour winds and glazed snow and blizzard conditions and below zero, it was minus 15 the other night here in December. We had tornadoes last year in December. It's just crazy weather from one year to the next. But bottom line is these deer need something to eat. And I'm not saying they're gonna starve around here. They're not, unless they're injured or something. But bottom line is, they need food. This is the time they need food. They're not wanting anything, lacking anything during the summertime, springtime. Once spring green up takes up, they have takes place, they have so much of an explosion of food, they don't need any they need anything. So when you get down to a 40 acre parcel, you're looking at what can I provide with the thought that the deer are already taken care of in the spring, summer, early fall. What can I provide not only that helps my hunt, but helps the deer herd, and that's gonna be focused on October, November, December. That's gonna be that time. Send those deer herd in the winter with a full belly, full of energy reserves, and they're gonna be healthy. So those are some things to consider. You know, Are you looking at making really thick cover right down here? When it comes to cover, are you making this so thick that it's too thick? But cover, critical. Thick is good sometimes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But when it comes to that food or cover, make sure that if you're focusing on food, you're focusing on the right amount for the size parcel you have, either a pass-through or feeding parcel. Number two, your food plot should rarely be in the middle. Let me show you this real quick. I don't know, if Dylan, if this is on the screen right here. So 40-acre lopsided parcel. We'll just say there's a river over here, not that I can't draw straight. But bottom line is you put five acres of food in the middle, well, when you go on a 40 acre parcel to, eat, to any side, you only have 155 yards of depth. A 40 acre parcel is 440 yards by 440 yards. So very poor depth to cover ratio. You have a very small margin where you expect to have deer come to this food source, which is five acres for 40 acres is big, and feed on that. And then you expect to house these deer in here there's not as much depth. So what you're doing is you're putting mature bucks out here, here, here on your neighbors. No reason for them to be in here in the commotion of does and fawns and the type of deer herd that hits that food source on a daily basis. They don't want to be within that stress, so they leave. And do they even ever come to that food source during daylight? The more borders they cross with these small parcels, the more suspect they are to be in harvested by your neighbors. The more fences they cross, borders, hunters are exposed to, and they don't get to a mature age at, the, at that point. So you really have to look at, when you have that food in the middle, creates problems for you. How can you hunt around that food in the afternoon, evening? Unless you're waiting for deer to come off your neighbors to go through your parcel to get to that only 150 yards away. That's a bad scenario too, because again, you put your, your deer on your neighbors, or the local deer on your neighbors. So food is rarely in the middle. On the other hand, you put that on the side. You know, a five acre plot on the side of 20 acres on the, on the narrow end, let's say that end is right here, you're putting that five acres down here, nothing here. I mean, you still have over 300 yards of depth. Now you can hold those fawns. So I like to put that food up against an ag field where the deer are going to anyways. That way it lets you come in on the non-ag side if you have ag around you or a neighbor's food source, neighbors are baiting, whatever it might be. Now you're holding deer in that larger food plot, two acres, three acres, until dark, and then you release them to that ag land. So they're not going to that ag land until after dark. That allows you to get in the morning on the opposite side of your food. So on the opposite side of your pro property from where the food's at. That gives you morning stands, evening stands, and a reasonable expectation that you can get on and off your property without spooking deer. And that's why it's so critical on a acre, let's say you have eight acres, 10 acres, that you would have a small amount of food, maybe a food plot trail with a couple scrapes on it, a small hunting plot, but you're not putting those in the middle because now you have to walk through your property to get there, but you're putting it on one side. 
that allows you to have some depth. Even on a, a 10 acre tract, most 10 acre tracts are 110 by 440 as far as yards. So 330 feet by 1320. If you look at it that way, if you locate your food down in the middle, say a half acre, one acre plot, you can get around it on either side, a little strip in the middle or something, you know, fr from the bottom. If you look at the north side, that's still a quarter mile away. So you can still develop a lot of depth even on 10 acres when, in, when you know, a lot of 10 acres are, are cut up like that. So that depth of cover is critical. Always think about that because it not only puts deer more on your land where you expect them to come and live from during the daylight hours, but it sets up, uh, sets up that assemblage of stands where you have reasonable expectation that you can go in and say, I'm gonna hunt here in the morning on this side of the property. You know, again, looking at Here's this 10 acre parcel, quarter mile by 110 yards right here. So 440 by 110 right here. Put a small food source, you know, somewhere down here, somewhere where you can get by on either side. This might be three quarters of an acre, half acre. Now you have areas where you can create a deer trail back here on the outside of cover, deer will be there because the wind's going this direction. So you're sitting in a stand here, they're going this direction. The wind's going this direction. So a buck is cruising here because he can scent check the inside of this cover. Or he's over here. So you have stands for multiple winds in the morning. You can get around that food. And then you have stand locations down here by that food source in the evening. Maybe you can have a little strip of food that involved a logging trail that you had where there's some scrapes on it. You know, deer are bedding here and they're traveling on this to get to that food source down here. Bottom line is it just sets up that assemblage because you haven't stuck the food right in the middle of the food plot now what do you, or the, the 10 acres. Now what do you do? Really tough because a lot of times you're typically walking through the bedding to get near that food. And if deer, you're drawing something, drawing deer to a spot where you can't physically even see every single afternoon. Yeah, maybe you have a camera that tells you that a buck's going there every night, but how do you hunt them? Where do you hunt them? So you set yourself up for failure. And that's why it's so critical to not put that food in the middle. Once you have that food and you determine the right spot for it, that determines your access. The more you define the deer bed here or feed here, in the case of small property, you're making it very thick. You know where they're bedding on one side of the, of the other. Maybe this is the roadside, so that means deer bed on the other side of the property. Maybe this is where you access out of your house, neighbors, whatever it might be. You can determine where those deer are more likely to bed by doing that, and that allows you to access where they're not feeding, where they're not bedding. Set you up your access. You can access on the bedding side during the dark hours. You can access on the food side during the daylight hours. You come out of your stand at 11, go in at three. Either way, you can walk right through that food sometimes, get into a stand or right, walk right alongside and not spook deer. You start to have that assemblage, and that's what locating good and building good food and, and uh, bedding areas will allow you to do because you know where the deer aren't when you're going in the daylight, coming out in the daylight, or going in, walking in dark hours, either entering or exiting a stand location. So always think about that. A lot of people you get really confused on access, but it's because they won't give up this really nice food pot that they've spent a lot of years working on. Or they have a really good bedding area. They put a water hole in the wrong spot. Hey, we've blown out two water holes here. We've literally got a skid steer, gone into the back, opened it up, let the water drain out of a small little water hole about the size of this room, let's say 12 feet by 15 feet, whatever it might be, wrong spot. So not only is it a bad spot to draw deer to and draws them away from our tree stand, but it sets us up for poor access if we want to access through that location. So you have to look past, look at it more black and white. We look at like Dylan and I, Kevin Jogoto property, and that's why we don't like to hear a lot about it other than where current things are, because it's really easy just to say, hey, that food plot's in the wrong spot. Yeah, I know you worked on it for years. I know you lined it. But it's bad. It's hurting you. So we look at it sometimes, you know, if you're going to keep that food plot, just know you're never going to come close to your potential because you're spooking deer every time you come on and off. We look at it pretty black and white, and you should too. Thick is really good, but you have to consider a few things. So thick parcel. You still have to walk through it. I've seen five acre clear cuts on a Michigan property where a deer had one trail to go through. They couldn't bed in it. They couldn't walk through it. You know what they do? They avoid it because they're sitting ducks, they're trapped. They can't run anywhere. Pack of wild dogs, lower Michigan farmland comes running in. Deer have nowhere to go. They're up against a bunch of logs and blowdowns. So you want very, very few dead ends. So when you start making six acres out of 10 acres 
of land very thick. You have to be very careful. That you're not making it so thick the deer can't move through it. Your dead ends should be far, far less than your pass-throughs, meaning very few dead ends. Think of it as a never-ending maze where you don't come to deer ends, dead ends, and that's what you want to do. So think about that when it's when it's thick. Another thing to consider is, do you have predators? Is this in a big woods area or not? If it's in a big woods area, you have to be very careful because if you make 10 acres in the UP of Michigan, Northern Minnesota, upstate New York, even a big hardwood area in Kentucky, we're not even talking north south. What we're looking at is if you take deer that are able to expand over hundreds of acres of timber and cover, and you tell them, I want you to live in this small compartmentalized area, of very thick cover, guess what? They're not going to do it. So you take five acres surrounded by a wilderness area, public land up north somewhere. I'd rather see it three acres of food in a parcel like that because now I can use a quarter mile of public land to access around there. Now I can hunt by the food and then I can hunt half mile back on public land as those bucks are deer in general are coming back to me. So you have to, always have to consider you know, big parcel, big woods parcel, or are you an ag land parcel where things are fragmented? What are the deer used to bedding in? And that's why I don't like people when they say, well, I never walk into my sanctuary. I never go into it. I had a client on that about 20 acres in lower Michigan, and here there'd been a tornado that went through five years earlier in places a ghost town. The deer literally couldn't walk through the property because there's logs sideways of big giant maple clusters that have blown over, and we could hardly climb through there. And then it was mud in between. It was terrible. It was a terrible property. And here the guy thought it was this beautiful sanctuary sanctuary, but that's why he hired us, because you go out there and there's no deer coming from there. Why? Well, it's pretty easy to just go in there. That's why you always want to go in your sanctuaries. You always want to go in your bedding areas. Where are deer bedding and why? How are they related to cover? You'll learn a lot by observing that. Very, really important to do so. So think about that, how thick. You want it thick, especially in those ag lands where they're used to being compartmentalized, but they have to be able to move through it. The thicker you make it, it makes it easier for you to get around, not spook deer. So always consider those things. Hunt very carefully, this is number five. You're designing a small micro parcel, you can't again afford to make mistakes. That's why I began hunting in the weather back in the 90s, early 90s, because I didn't have a lot of time to hunt. I worked at a bank, I, I didn't have a lot of time off. I'd take a half day, a day off at a time out of my two weeks vacation. So when I did take a half day off and I went up for a long weekend or even just a Wednesday afternoon to hunt, I wanted to make sure that when I went and sat in this five acres of cover corner out of a 120 acre ag field, or I sat on the edge of this 40 acres, where I could only hunt the fence rows. Or I went and hunted, literally we called the five acre woods and the 10 acre woods because that's what we had to hunt. I had to be so careful because if I went and spooked that, the deer out of that five acre woods, they weren't coming back till the following day, the next day. And depending on how violently I spooked them, they might not be coming back for days. Really important uh, concept. Again, if that was a thousand acres, I could have made a lot of mistakes as a kid. And, and still shot some decent buck here and there because they would have been there. But I hunted in such small parcels and woodlots and fence rows that if I spooked deer, I didn't have any deer. And that was the only place I had to hunt. So it's very important for me to make strong weather decisions. That's why HuntWise contacted me and said, hey, we want to put your, we want to infuse your weather algorithm into our hunt cast. That weather algorithm works, doesn't matter if you're scouting during the summertime, the off season or deer season. It's called HuntCast. The link is always in the description. You guys can check that out. I believe in that because I've used it for 30 years. Those are the same principles and same tips and strategies I've used because I didn't have a lot of time to hunt and I had small parcels so I couldn't afford to make mistakes. So I had to hunt by the weather to make sure when I went out, it wasn't 80 degrees in early November and I'm wasting my half day off. Yeah, it was cool to get away from the bank and go sit in a deer stand for a half day, but I, I could have nature an hour and 45 minutes and be at my house and not have to drive that time. I didn't have a lot of money to be going back and forth either. So I had to make very smart decisions as it related to my time off, also to the money spent to go up there and my resources in general. That's why from day one, back in the late 80s, we have to have quiet tree stands. We have to have quiet gear, quiet boots when we're walking. If you can't sneak up on your buddy on, on a, a pavement and walk up to him with all your gear on, your, your bow over your back, I always like to put mine over my shoulder, stabilizer, people ask that. Stabilizer fits right in here. I'm probably making a bunch of mic noise right now, but stabilizer fits right in here in this quarter zip or whatever I'm wearing or the jacket. And I just walk like that. It's nothing magical. People say, how do you carry that on there? Do you have some snap or something? No, it just hangs there. I mean, just goes over my shoulder, stabilizers on this side, sights on the back. The bottom line is 
you want to be able to walk up to your hunting buddy, get within a few feet, and they don't hear that you're coming. That's what it takes. Let alone when you're snapping sticks. Snapping sticks is okay. At least other deer snap sticks. Even your leaf noise, if you walk heel to toe and walk slow, the closer I get to the stand, the more I'm really sneaking up on that stand. Almost like stalking the stand. I want it to get quieter the closer I get. But you can't go into a 10 acre parcel. Like I think of some of the bucks that I watched all summer. One was in, it was a wide one. Let's say it was 97, somewhere around there. So I knew this buck was going into a bedding area. I had to go all the way down the river, the Cass River, going on the back of the river, and then come back up to the field on the property I could hunt in a pre-positioned stand that was there since July, stand I hadn't gone to, and then wait for that buck to come into me. If I went in there, and it was only 50, 70 yards of cover before it got out to the open fields, and I made a big clang in my stand, if I used a climbing stand and went up there and made a bunch of noise, if I didn't have pre-set, pre-hung stands, and I couldn't just get right up there, so easy to spook out not only that buck, but the entire deer herd, especially on a small parcel. Again, you can make tons of mistakes on a big parcel because the size of the parcel encompasses your noise and your mistakes. Not so on a small one and certainly scent. You can't afford to blow your scent through your property. People on an eight acre parcel will say, well, I never blow my scent into that. I, I never allow my scent to go into this eight acres over here. That's great, but the deer can hear them and see them alongside or vice versa. You know, the deer can't hear me in that five acres of sanctuary, but then they let their scent blow into there. They think, well, it's good for the stand location, but then it's blowing into that sanctuary. You have to be critically careful. Those same concepts apply to public land. Now, maybe you're going in on a public land buck that you've scouted, and it's a small island in a marsh. You're waiting for that buck to come back to you in the morning. You still have to be careful on your access, going around food, you have to know where that food's at. You have to get on the back side of the bedding area. The back side of the bedding area is where I don't expect deer to be. They should be in front of me. I'm on the back. So I'm shooting deer in the back and on a small island that might be only two acres, three acres, a couple oak trees. I'm on the back side. You can almost shoot the whole thing. But you're coming into the back. You're waiting for deer to come back to you. You're using quiet gear, quiet equipment. You're watching the wind. And oh, by the way, if it's a warm morning, he's probably already there. So you're probably picking a cool morning and you're sneaking in there, waiting for them to come back to you. Sometimes you have to beat the crowd, I understand, so you're back there on a warm morning on opening day or the second day, hoping that no one else is. A bottom line, it's the same concepts on public land and hunting a lot of good spots, especially for bow, as it is right here. So you can do it. You can build these small parcels. Now that's what almost all of these videos are about, are about hunting small parcel. Otherwise, I'd tell you, just go drive an ATV to the stand, sit down, who cares? Who cares if you're spooking deer? Spooking deer is almost a sin. You can't do that. If you're very careful, and that's because the roots of all this content and all this information on this channel come from very small parcels, woodlots, five acre woodlots, fence rows, just buy permission, shake a hand, type hunting decades ago, and that's what leads us to here because you can't afford to make mistakes. Doesn't matter if it's my property in here in Minnesota. The problem is I only hunt private land around here. So when I make a mistake, I don't, I ruin the property. I can't hunt for two or three weeks to, for the bucks that I expect. Can't afford to make mistakes in small parcels. These are some tips that you can take to design any small parcel, any size parcel that you have from a few acres to thousands of acres. It's the same concepts. We're going to make the same recommendation for someone that has 1,600 acres as someone that makes six acres. The only difference is, or has six acres now, the only difference is they have a whole lot more work and time and money in that 1,600 acres. Lots of it. I have enough acreage here with food plots and everything that it's a, almost a full-time job. That's what I'm doing basically when I get home from client visits, when I'm not filming, when I'm not working for sponsors, partners, I'm out on the land and I'm not complaining. I love it. That's what we all love to do. Dylan loves it. That's why he does what he does. Kevin, Joe, we love to do these things. So kind of, I hope this makes sense. You can design any small parcel. Really urge you to check out our hills and thermals web class that just came out. That's how you can be careful, number five here in Hunt. Make sure you can learn how to cheat the wind. Where to bucks bed within those hills. That class will teach you. We have the design class, how to design your whitetail parcel. We have the food plot class, how to design your food plot program. The rut hunting class. I have all my books. And hey, if you don't want to buy any of it, just watch all these videos for free and we'll do our best to keep them coming so we can help you out for this off season and leading in to next year's deer season.